Our second lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 8, and I will be reading from verse 26 to the end of this chapter. It's um, an understatement to say that uh, this is one of the most eloquent passages in all of Scripture, and certainly in Paul. Um, it is also, in some ways, the culmination of the argument that Paul is making from the very first verse of the letter to this point, and then filling it in from then on. Um, to be sure, the uh, letter to the Romans is Paul's densest theological work, not easy to be sure to understand. Um, but in some ways, it's captured, the essence of it is captured in these most eloquent, elevated words from Paul. I invite you to read along in your pew Bible or simply listen for the Word of God as I read these words. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray <clears throat> as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. For those whom God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that he might be the firstborn of a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long and we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. She was Honduran and very tiny and very pregnant. She was being interviewed by Sister Norma of Catholic Charities in the Rio Grande Valley. The Honduran woman had escaped with her daughter to save her daughter. Her daughter was 12 years old and had become a prime target of poachers, of the killer gangs in Honduras. Indeed, one of the gang members had come into their house and slashed the, woman, the woman's hand with a machete and her, her daughter's arm. They managed to escape. They paid a coyote, that is a border smuggler, to get them across the border. She is one, she and her daughter is one of a flood, flood of Latin American refugees 
coming into this country. Uh, we're being made aware of it more all the time. It's actually been happening for a very long time, but the flood is increasing, and we know that. Some have called it the um, Latino refugee crisis, just as there's a crisis in Syria and Iraq. But this is happening in our country. It's very close at hand. This woman from Honduras is one of the lucky ones. She has family in the United States, and the Border Patrol uh, of peop for people who have families will give them a bus ticket to their families and then take them to one of the holding stations like Catholic Charities, who will interview them, find out who they are, uh, give them uh, a shower, safe place to stay for a while, a medical exam, and then a ride to the bus station. Again, she's one of the lucky ones she and her daughter, because most don't end up that way. That particular center um, takes in about 200 a day and sends them off. 200, that's just one center. And those are all the lucky ones, because the rest go into holding cells. And we've heard all about that. Politicians uh, seldom visit these places, and I, I suspect we can be cynical about that and call it the midterm elections or something like that. Awfully cynical, isn't it? But then, it seems like a no-win for politicians. It would take a courageous stand to actually do something. Courageous in the extreme. I, I, again, that's cynical. But maybe it's easier to do something in the Middle East because it's a far, a much further away than, send, than to send the Secretary of State to South Texas or Honduras or El Salvador or Guatemala where the travesty is taking place. The gangs that are creating anarchy in that country, in those countries. Reinhold Niebuhr <clears throat> once said that uh, the great political dangers in life are tyranny and anarchy, and most people uh, <clears throat> launched upon um, um, tyranny as the great political uh, enemy of existence. And certainly Reinhold Niebuhr experienced that in his um, experience of Nazi Germany. But I wonder if he got it right, too, when he said anarchy is the other, because that's what we're seeing in so many parts of Latin America and in South Texas and in the borders across the South is anarchy, a refugee crisis. In light of that, it's, it's, it's and, and many other crises that we face, it, it's hard to read the words in St. Paul, all things work together for good, isn't it? Those platitudes are used so often, we get so used to saying them. Linda mentioned it last week in her sermon. It was Catherine Marshall's favorite saying. Um, and I don't, I don't blame people for saying it and for believing in that and hoping for that. Um, and yet, I do wonder about it sometimes. As a pastor, I hear that platitude, that uh, bromide for almost every ailment. Um, offered uh, in the most inappropriate of settings, settings where it's not appropriate to have a sound theological conversation about what that might mean. I've often felt that those words should have a red asterisk on them in every translation, <laughs> saying, do not take this out of context. <laughs> and maybe a mandate that says, actually read this letter, <laughs> the whole of it, it's, astound, it's an astounding thing to do, to <clears throat> read all of Paul's letter to the Romans, some of the densest theology. It's, it, it, it's a hard letter. And I'm still learning a lot about that letter that I didn't know. Um, and if we read it in context and ponder the good that has in mind that God is working toward, some startling things come to light. I just learned something this week that really uh, blew my mind. Um, and it's all about immigration. It's all about immigration. Did you know that in the ancient world, the Roman Empire, that is, all roads literally went to and from Rome? Yeah, 
All roads literally went to and from Rome. A little bit like Washington, D.C. I mean, uh, people have said that there are more immigrants and more uh, nas uh, international folk in Washington, D.C. And I say, well, out of necessity almost, people have to come here. And they had to come to Rome. They had to come to Rome. It was the politically important place to be. Um, interesting that scholars tell us that Rome was populated by almost 40% immigrants. 40%. It's a staggering figure. And it's very likely, according to scholars, that the Roman uh, Christian church was largely an immigrant church. Largely immigrant. In fact, we know that from Romans 16. Uh, the list of names there are almost all Eastern names. Some of them suggest that most of them were slaves or former slaves. And they had come to Rome for a variety of reasons. Um, and Paul was made aware of this because he probably knew many of these folk. In fact, two people are named in Romans 16, uh, Prisca and Aquila, who are also named in Acts chapter 8 as uh, compatriots of Paul. People who worked with Paul in his ministry, tent-making ministry, they were part of this Roman church, probably Jewish Christians that were exiled by Claudius in 49 AD. The story is this. Claudius became aware of the tensions between Jews and Jewish Christians. He didn't like it, and so he just banished them all. And uh, there was a five-year period in which they were all gone from Rome, or at least the predominant leadership were gone from Rome. And Paul probably got to know many of these Jewish Christians that were exiled from Rome, got to know what the circumstances were that they were living in, the problems of the Roman church, the real pastoral needs of this uh, Roman church. He probably became aware of them through a variety, but especially during the, uh, from the people who are named in Romans uh, chapter 16. And it turns out that the problems were severe because after the Jews were exiled, it the church in Rome became largely Gentile. It assumed a Gentile culture. It assumed a Gentile ways. It assumed everything Gentile. Kind of like the church is today. It assumes the way of the culture, right? White church becomes really, really white. A black church becomes black. It's, it's, it's just the way it is, I guess. Um, but what Paul saw here was it was not all good. When the edict was released and the Jews came back, the Gentiles did not really receive this news with great glee and excitement, for they had their ways. There were obviously tensions that grew up between the Jewish and the Christian congregations. There were many house congregations throughout um, uh, Rome, and they did not receive the Jews back uh, with great hospitality, shall we say. And so in Romans uh, 14 and 15, the great admonition of Paul is to receive one another in love. And because that's an admonition, you got to know that they weren't doing it, right? And Paul was aghast. Which brings a point to the larger context of what Paul was about and his understanding of the great danger of the world. His understanding of the great danger of the world was enmity hostility, one towards the other. It is reflected in all of Paul's letters. Um, from Galatians to Corinthians, you read through it, and you read that in the light of enmity um, and hostility, divisions, not just divisions, but hostile divisions that happened in the church. Um, the antidote, he said, was hospitality, the hospitality of God that God has given to us. But the, great anti but, the, but the great enemy for Paul was this hostility that existed between, in the world that existed between Christians of all people. For you see, Paul believed that we lived in an occupied territory, and that occupied territory was ruled by enmity, one with the other, divisions and exclusions that are demonizing. The kinds of polarizations that bring in and out, rich and poor, uh, racial divisions, you name it, he knew all of it. And he was aghast that the church of all places would do this. And so that's why he wrote his letters. This cannot exist in the church. 
It's really interesting that, <clears throat> that the uh, noted Paul scholar, uh, Christer Stendhal, who used to teach at Harvard, wrote a huge amount on Paul, stunned the world uh, uh, several years ago when, when, when he said that, you know, it's a mistranslation when uh, we uh, translate in Paul's letters the notion of the forgiveness of sin. Paul never talks about the forgiveness of sin. That's what Crystal Stendhal said. That the Greek word is really not the forgiveness of sin. The Greek words for, that are often translated in the, in the NRSV, you can go into to, to your Bible, the Hebrew Bible, and you'll find forgiveness in there in Paul's letters. But the Greek word is actually not that. It actually means to welcome, to receive, to offer hospitality to. That's the great message of the gospel for Paul. And that brings us right back to Romans chapter 8. Because if God is a God of hospitality and, and the great admonition of Christians is hospitality to, to others, it's not just about being nice to others. It's not just, can we all just get along? <laughs> no, it comes from a deep rootedness of how hostility deforms and defaces human existence to the core and how God is about countering that hostility. And so Paul says it pointedly in Romans chapter 8 when he says, if God is for us, then who is against us? God who did not withhold his own son, but gave his son up for us? Now let me offer a, a paraphrase of that. If God and God's self is for us, then who is against us? God who offered God's self and became incarnate into the hostilities of the world and became a victim of those very hostilities, became a victim of them, a cross even. It's interesting how Paul will name the surrogates of hostility and enmity. He names them, and it's, it's important to take note of them because he doesn't leave them to our imagination. Chief among them, I think, are nakedness and peril and sword. The chief enmities of the world, I think, are, are those. Uh, nakedness is a code word for homelessness. It's a code word for poverty, extreme poverty. Peril, an interesting word. Because you see, the ancient world also had gangs. Anarchy. Gang violence and anarchy pervaded the Roman world. Uh, that was one of the chief things that the Romans sought to uh, bear down on. And then he mentions sword, the chief instrument of the imperial tyrannical rule. Really interesting uh, comments that he makes. Some, some have suggested to us all along that Paul is not political, and I, I beg to disagree. <laughs> he is a most political figure. He understands the hostility in the world as political hostility. It's a, it's a personal hostility. It's a communal hostility. And he says the church should have none of it. It should be a beacon of love because Jesus came into the midst of that hostility and exposed it for what it is, not the way of God, and then countered it with love and hospitality. And then in this lesson, Paul says something stunning, and I want to confess something, that, that this, is a, this is a lesson, our morning scripture lesson, that I often read at, at a memorial services. In fact, I want it read at mine, if somebody could remember that. Um, um, this, this is a, a powerful passage. It should be read there, but I always leave something else because it's rather confusing. When he says, we are being killed all the day long, it's a verbatim quote from the psalm. I leave it out because it's confusing. I, I, you, know, you almost have to explain it. What do you mean? We're killed all the day long. Well, you see, I suspect very deeply that what Paul has in mind here is that we are followers of the hospitable God who came in the midst of the hostilities in the world. Then that's where we're supposed to go to, to the cruciform places of human existence, to the deep demonizing polarizations and hostilities of our world, to those deep places because that is the very place where God is bringing the great good of life. And that great good is hospitality. It's reconciliation and restoration and love. It's not to go to those places and stand with one side or the other. It's to go and stand between them and perhaps to get shot at at both sides, from both sides. That's a dangerous place to be. I felt that many times in the Middle Eastern crisis.
How can you be both pro-Israeli pro and pro-Palestinian at the same time? Uh, one side or the other just won't let you do it. You're going to get shot at. It's a place of great hostility. It's a great, it's a place of cruciformity. But it's also the very place where there is the potential of reconciliation and, rec and restoration and love. It is the very place where God's great good can be worked. And so the question for us today is, what do we do with this? Well, I think we're already doing it in our ministries, to be sure. The many ministries of this church, and we can name them. You know what they are. You're standing in those cruciform places, many of you. But there's many more things we can do, especially about the crises that I've named here this morning. Um, and so something came to mind uh, in the Thursday morning prayer group. Um, the, the 10 o'clock prayer group, I want to let you know about this group. It's been meeting for how many years? Over 10 years. And uh, it's a wonderful group of folk. All of you are invited. I understand it's an awkward time, uh, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful group. I often call it the New York Avenue Politics Hour. <laughs> because wherever we start in prayer or theology or, or spirituality, we end up somehow in politics. And, and, and Louise Berman said something. Louise, I'm, I'm, I, I told you I might signal you out on Thursday. She said something to us that, that really struck me that I think we need to hear. Why isn't the church saying something? Why? The travesties that are going on in South Texas, why aren't we saying something? Why don't we say something reconciling and restorative in the Middle East that is not simply on one side or the other? And why are we allowing the gutting of health care subsidies for the very poor. Why do we just stand by? I think Louise is right. We can't do that. Because people who know the hospitality of God, people who understand that God is for us and not against us, but even more than that, we know the hospitable God, shall we say the immigrant God who left heaven, and place God's self amid the hostilities of the world and bore the brunt of them to be resurrected and reveal a love that will not die calls us too to stand in those places and to speak up. And we do that because we know the great good of God, the hospitable immigrant God who came in our midst to convince us that neither life nor death nor rulers nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor principalities and powers can separate us from the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so the people said, Amen. Amen.